everyone, I'm Chris Hernandez and this is the Weekly Report, a look at news from the city of Kansas City, Missouri. It's finally feeling more like spring outside, so let's shake off those winter blues and get moving. With Arbor Day this week, you might even be inspired to plant a tree. But did you know the city has a recommended tree list? This list helps encourage tree diversity and encourages you to plant trees that will do well in Kansas City's extreme weather. The Parks and Recreation Department recommends trees such as redbud, serviceberry, sugar cone maple, and white flowering dogwood. For a complete list of recommended trees, visit kcmo.gov slash weekly report. If you don't have room in your yard for a new tree, you can always volunteer with the Heartland Tree Alliance to plant trees all around the city. For more information, go to bridgingthegap.org. The city's innovative dollar house sale of land bank properties has benefited many neighborhoods by helping remove blighted properties from the dangerous buildings list. Now the land bank is offering a new program that makes 25 homes available for sale at the low price of just $100 to teachers and government employees. The Kansas City Land Bank will take applications until May 28th. Keep in mind that buyers need to pass a background check, have no delinquent property taxes, and no unresolved property code violations. They'll need to have access to at least $8,500 to begin repairs, as well as meeting several other conditions, which are listed at kcmolandbank.org. West Bottoms Reborn is a two-year project focusing on infrastructure and the arts in one of Kansas City's oldest neighborhoods. You are invited to participate in one of several creative public events. On May 1st is a moderated panel discussion at Faultless Event Space from 11.30 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. The Problems of Placemaking will be moderated by Megan Krigger, KCMO's Director of Creative Services. It includes artists who are part of the project's design team. Tickets are only $5 and lunch is provided. Visit westbottomsreborn.com, click on Events, and then use the Eventbrite link to register for this event. The website includes information about other public events, including bike rides and project exhibits. This project is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts Our Town Grant, and here's a closer look at one of the earlier events. In many ways, the role of artists in the city is to constantly prompt imagination. And I think a city needs to think of like the artistic speech of a city. What does that say? What is it? Is it the public art? Is it the symphony? What are all these sort of artistic elements of a city that give Kansas City its identity? So think of the artist community and the cultural community as part of the artistic speech of the city. Well, I would like to see artists at the table all the time. Not at the end, not as an add-on, but as an integral part of imagining, envisioning, of decision-making. Each of us has a, a realm of um, people that we're in contact with, that we influence, and that influence us. I would hope that attendees come away from today's presentation with a renewed sense of their own uh, purpose. The arts have this incredible energy and neighborhood folks have energies and, and there's all these forces at play and that the outcome is just a better life. This kind of conversation can be very stimulating for people on many different levels. And I'm hoping, I know that next time three artists are speaking and I'm very inspired by those three people myself. So I, I'm really hoping this, the kind of conversation that we had today can be carried on.
I'm here with a group of Southeast high school students or seniors. Many of them live within these boundaries and they're tired of seeing trash around so they thought it'd be a great way to give back and also earn some community service hours. This year has just been outstanding as far as civic involvement goes. One of our students, Omari Tatum, has really been involved with um, the city in making sure that we can represent Southeast Kansas City Public Schools in any way we can. So we had students speak at the March for Our Lives and we had students speak a few weeks ago on the sidewalk talks and now, you know, getting involved in the community wherever we can. So I think it's great that our young people are really finding the value in reaching out to the city and giving back. I hear that all the time and when I tell people I teach seniors in high school, they roll their eyes and say, I, you know, I don't know what we're going to do with this generation. These are the moments that people don't talk about. These kids came up with this idea all on their own. They just needed an adult to get them here. And if we take them up on these ideas to give back to their community and get them outside and off their devices and giving back and having the city and the news come you know, show their excitement as well, it's just going to invigorate the rest of the youth to really get involved. And I hope that older generations can see that and be encouraged by that as well. The Origin KC New Works Festival kicks off on April 27th and includes parties, panel discussions, and world and regional premiere productions. Here to tell us more about this event that is supported by the Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund is Marissa Wolf, New Works Director. Now, Marissa, thank you so much for having us here thank at the you. Kansas City Repertory offices. Yes, yes. Well, we're thrilled to share the third annual Origin KC New Works Festival. So the festival was started three years ago as a way to respond to new voices and new plays coming out that are looking at issues of this moment, of our time, questions that we ask ourselves every day, both in Kansas City and across the country. Mm -hmm. This year's festival features three amazing new plays, Brother Toad by Nathan Lewis Jackson that looks at Kansas City families and how they protect themselves in an era of mounting gun violence, um, Carolee Corthron's play Welcome to Fear City, which is, looks at the birth of hip hop in the 1970s Bronx, and Letters from Freedom Summer by Ricardo Kahn, who leads the project with UMKC MFA students, undergrads, and community members. Um, and that one's here on the um, Spencer stage. And that one looks at the 1964 uh, Freedom Summer in which people uh, worked on the right to vote for black folks in the South. Um, we're thrilled to present these three plays in rotating repertory. So one night you can come and see one play and you come back the next night and see a different play. Um, and then on May 11th and 12th, we have something called Festival Weekend. This is an incredible weekend at the Copagan stage where you can not only catch these productions, the full productions, but you can also see three new play readings and catch uh, all kinds of panel discussions that will go really deep into um, our cultural moment and the role arts play in thinking about um, politics and um, perspective. And we'll also, of course, offer many parties, lunches, um, and we love bringing people together to break bread and share in art. Well, and so the productions are ticketed, but right. the rest of the programming is free. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. So we try to keep um, the production tickets um, accessible to all, mm -hmm. um, and we've got uh, great offers for you if you go to our website. Um, and the festival weekend with the readings is completely free. So you can drop by, see all three readings, catch a panel, have a meal with us, or just come to one and check it out. Um, readings can be so fun because you're seeing a new play in process. Mm -hmm. You actually get to be at the forefront of the creation of art. And one of the other things that I love about the Origin KC New Works Festival is that audiences come together to discuss the powerful topics that are looked at inside the plays. We have a community conversation that we host after every production, and we talk with audiences about um, the questions that the plays raise. We're really interested in engaging um, not only as artists and audience, but as a community. So as a parent, if you're deciding what activities to do with your children, what would be the ideal age that you would recommend? 
We're saying 12 and up. I think that um, these plays are certainly accessible and have a youthful element, and so middle school, high school age will really connect to the themes in the play. And as far as your audiences that you're hoping to reach, what, what has been your attendance in the past? Where, where do audience members come from, and where, how many people are you anticipating this year? Great question. So we've got um, our core rep audiences who come from the greater Kansas City area, absolutely, um, Jackson and Johnson County and the Northlands. Um, but we've also draw a lot of new audiences with the festival um, because we're telling new stories. Um, we've got a wonderful sort of multi-generational spread in most of our festival shows um, and a more diverse audience. Um, we also are thrilled to welcome out-of-town guests for, um, for the festival, including some VIP artistic thought leaders leaders and uh, artistic directors from across the country who come in and see the work we're doing here and respond to it. Um, and if you come out on the festival weekend, you'll get to hear their responses and engage with them in the national conversation. Um, we are so grateful for the Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund for their support so that we can get the word out that this festival is happening and uh, build a major local and national presence. Great. And where's the best place to get all of the information about the festival? You can purchase tickets and find out information on our website, kcrep.org. Great. Well, thank you so much for having us here at the Rep, and we're looking forward to the festival. Thank you so much. The Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund supports local nonprofits that bring cultural, social, educational, and recreational activities to our area. about additional upcoming events, visit kcmo.gov slash ntdf. Seven years ago, in the year 1981, this fountain was first built, and the two individuals that led that effort were Senator Yvonne Wilson, representing the Spirit of Freedom Foundation, and Mr. Ollie Gates, representing the Bruce Watkins Foundation in Shriners. Anybody else here 37 years ago? A few other folks? So. Good to see you this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark McHenry with the Kansas City, Missouri Board of Parks and Recreation Commissioners. And we have a few of our other former commissioners today, along with Mr. Gates. 
Anita Gorman, Carl DeCapo, and Ann Garnier joining us. And we also have uh, some current commissioners here, uh, Mary Jane Judy, Dave Mecklenburg, and Alan Dillingham. And Alan's going to make a few comments on behalf of the Park Board. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day. I thought it was going to be a little colder out here, and the sun really makes a difference. So I uh, appreciate everybody being out here for this great day. Um, there's two things that, to me, signify springtime. One's opening day for the Royals, and the other one is, is turning on the fountains here in Kansas City. Um, hopefully, turning on the fountains maybe will help the, the Royals uh, here, but uh, we have a long season, so I'm still hopeful. Um, this day is a really a reminder of all the great heritage that we have in our city and the park system. We've been given a world-renowned system of parks, boulevards, parkways, fountains, and monuments, all of which was part of this beautiful, city beautiful movement back then. So our city's leadership 125 years ago had an amazing foresight to create this system, and they really put Kansas City on the map then. Since we all stand on the shoulders of those people, we get to enjoy what they've created. It's our responsibility now to grab that and really move it forward and continue that stewardship of our great heritage. This is one of my favorite days of the year. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's great to see the, all the other uh, fellow commissioners here. And uh, we're looking forward to another great season of parks and fountains. And please go out and enjoy them. Thanks. This fountain renovation, like a lot of fountain renovations, is a team effort and it takes funding from different sources. Uh, part of that is from the private sector, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later from a representative from the City of Fountains Foundation. Also a representative uh, from this district PIC funds, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about that from Councilman Reed. But a big part of it came from our general obligation bonds. And to talk a bit more about those geo bonds and what makes this project possible, our city manager, Troy Schulte. Well, good morning. This is a, another great day and a lot of great days we're having in Kansas City. Um, it is now officially spring. When we turn the fountains on in this town, we don't have to worry about snow and 31 degree weather. So um, I'm here today to just once again thank the residents of this city for approving that $800 million general obligation program last year. When we stood up uh, and asked voters for their support, we said one of the first things we're going to do as a city of fountains is make sure that all of our fountains are working. And I'm pleased to stand here today saying this one and another one is under construction and all of our fountains in this beautiful city will be running the way citizens deserve it. So hats off to our residents. Uh, a little history about the City of Fountains Foundation. It was uh, founded in 1973 by Harold and Peggy Rice. And they were, Harold was at a Hallmark Corporation at the time, and he wanted to do something because he had visited Rome and saw the deteriorating fountains there, and came up with the foundation, was officially established in 1974. Uh, in 2013, we ended up having the Festival of Fountains. And this kind of spearheaded our capital campaign, and we were able to raise uh, over $4 million to help all the various fountains through the, just private contributions alone. Um, thank you very much to Joni Shields for spearheading that as well. In 1883, the Humane Society of Kansas City was established to prevent cruelty to women, children, and animals. In 1904, they built Kansas City's first fountain west of the inner city Bardock at 3rd and Minnesota in Kansas City, Kansas. It had a very practical purpose. At the base were drinking pools for the dogs. At a horse hike, there were uh, basins for the horses to drink. And finally, at the top, there was a spigot so that humans could fill their cups. That particular fountain was moved uh, to 18th and Parallel, and in 1967, it was given to the Wyandotte County Museum. 
on December 8th, we gathered right outside here. Uh, there was a nice construction site that we kind of uh, assembled and this, on December the 8th, when we gathered here, that was 130 days ago. J.E. Dunn and their construction partners worked extremely hard over 130 days to ensure that this fountain was ready and prepared to go for renovations. So thank you so much to the folks who made that happen. In addition to that, that is, this is a good example of our city tax dollars at work with the general obligation bonds that really have really paved the way to make sure that this fountain and other work and all the cones and everything that you see going on across the entire city, that is exactly what uh, has helped pay for this. Okay, we're going to have you a countdown and the choir is going to do the countdown for us. Soon kids will be yelling, school's out for the summer. It's time to start thinking about summer camps and KC Parks has a wide variety of activities to keep your kids engaged all summer long. Kids can take a trip around the world without ever leaving home at the Campfire Heartland Summer Camp Program. Campers will learn about a variety of countries and cultures. Or do they want to be a star? Starlight Theater has a summer camp. Go to kcparks.org for more information. Keeping up with KCMO may not be quite as glamorous as keeping up with the Kardashians, but now you can watch the live stream of KCMO's Channel 2 24-7. You'll find it on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash KCMOCCO. We're now live streaming all of your favorite Channel 2 programming so that you don't have to miss a single moment. Be sure to subscribe to our channel to receive notifications every time we post something new. And that does it for this edition of the Weekly Report. Be sure to enjoy a happy new fiscal year on Tuesday, May 1st. I'm Chris Hernandez. See you next time.